There are lots of animals I've talked about on this channel that look objectively heinous. Creepy creatures that are poorly understood or really talked about. Often in order to answer the question, what the fuck is this? Their appearance alone sends chills down the spines of the general public. But sometimes the most basic run-of-the-mill animals can have that effect as well. Ones you can find in the local park have unusual behaviors that can appear to some to be a bad omen. That rather than make you ask, what the fuck is this? Beg the question, why the fuck is this? happening. I'm going to show you a few of them, and I'm not going to waste any more time. We're just going to get right into it. We're going to start off with a heavy hitter that requires an arachnophobia warning. If you want to skip it, go to this timestamp. But if you're here for the ride, then buckle the fuck up. Spider rain. What? Obviously, at first glance, this is pretty horrific, and I'm not sure if explaining it is going to make it better or worse for you. So spider rain is when spiders appear to fall from the sky in mass, like in the thousands or millions, and end up covering a landscape in webs that looks like some sort of radioactive precipitation. This godforsaken event has been documented in parts of North America, South America, Australia, Asia. At least that's what I found with a quick Google search. But I'm going to assume that this can happen anywhere that spiders exist. What's that saying? If you hear hooves, no. If you can't commit, no. God, that's gonna drive me crazy. Essentially, if there are spiders, there's a chance of spider rape. The most on-brand way this happens is through a process called ballooning. Just like little kids and the cute little old man from Up, spiders too dream of traveling to faraway lands by floating through the sky. The only difference is they make that shit happen, frequently. They climb to an elevated point, stick their abdomen up into the air, check to make sure the conditions are right, then release a few silk strands, like up to 60 of them, to make a big fan and take off into the wind. The spiders have been found ballooning up to two and a half miles in the sky and have been known to travel hundreds of miles using this method of transportation, the arachnid airlines, if you will. So how does this turn into this? Well, to understand that, you gotta know why spiders balloon in the first place. Many ballooning spider species tend to be associated with habitats that are like unstable or unpredictable. The easiest example is spiders in farmlands and crop fields. Think of all the plowing and the harvesting and pesticides and shit. Their habitats change drastically with no warning. So they can't really adapt to those changes since they're not predictable. Instead, it was more evolutionarily favorable for them to be able to dip with little to no notice. A slight problem is in the event of such drastic changes, the spiders need the right conditions to take off into the air. Like I had mentioned before, they go into downward dock. Check to make sure the conditions are right for takeoff. For a while, scientists knew the spiders needed a warm, gentle breeze of like, three meters per second, max. But there was something else the scientists were missing. The gentle breeze helped carry them into the air, but technically wasn't strong enough for the acceleration needed for takeoff. And in 2018, they found the missing piece, electric fields, which are always present in the atmosphere, but can shift based on thunderstorms or different weather conditions. And so at certain times around particularly sharp objects like branches, it can be strong enough to help get the spider into the air, blow it off into the wind. Let me look up how to pronounce that. <sighs> Spiders have these super sensitive hairs all over them called trichobothria. I think that's how you pronounce it. These are the source of their spidey senses. They can detect the slightest changes in air movement and sound, so they can literally feel the presence of animals around them. At like a microscopic degree. It is nuts. And it turns out that these hairs, unsurprisingly, can also respond to the electric field. And so, in the event that a particular landscape suddenly becomes unfavorable to the spiders living there, and they all need to dip, but the conditions aren't right, Arachnid Airlines shuts down, just like ours do around the holidays, leaving thousands, if not millions, stranded, waiting for the weather to turn around. And once it does, and the conditions are right for them to take off and float into the air, they all do at once, all of them, at the same time, creating these mass ballooning events to get dropped to the same location and wedded to shit. I had mentioned that ballooning is just the most on-brand way that spider rain happens, or the appearance of spider rain, but it's not the only way. It can also happen when lots of spiders in the same place suddenly have to move, responding to a natural disaster disaster as some sort of major weather condition. This happened during the flooding in Pakistan in 2010. Spiders took to the trees in mess to escape the flooding and ended up giving the trees hair nets. Apparently some people described this as a blessing in disguise because the spiders ate all the mosquitoes. But I think we can agree that most of the time people don't like to see arachnids or insects all appearing in mass at the same time. It can be quite unpleasant and at the very least a nuisance to society and shit like the cicadas. You might remember Brood X on the East Coast in 2021. If not, I'm gonna give you a recap anyway. Cicadas are little one to two inch long insects that live underground for the majority of their life only emerging to mate. Many cicadas emerge once a year, i.e. annually, but others only come out every one to two decades. So when they do, they show the fuck up. That was the case with Brood X. They emerge every 17 years. Early 2021 came around and everybody was like, they're coming, Brood X is on their way. Like, prepare yourselves. The world's on end next week. 
And they did in a trillions with a T, trillions. And it sounded like this. And then they made. That's all, folks. And now we won't see him until 2038. So mark your calendars. 2038. Brood X is coming back into town. Other times, these large groups can be more than a nuisance, like the Mormon crickets from earlier this year. That, again, stand her ground for like one to 10 years and then emerge all of a sudden in very large groups for a mating and feeding frenzy. Despite their name, they are not actually crickets. They are something called katydids, more closely related to grasshoppers and cannot fly. So they emerge in these massive groups of millions of them and cause chaos and destruction wherever they go at a surprisingly slow pace, moving about half a mile a day, covering landscapes, eating crops, and getting squished by cars and shit. And that's only the beginning of the pandemonium because Mormon crickets will eat Anything, flowers, dead animals, soil soaked in urine, exoskeletons of their pals, exoskeletons of themselves that they just molted off, and even their freshly fallen brethren. All is up for grabs, even cannibalism. They don't give a fuck. So these Mormon crickets were getting run over on the roads, creating a slick squish, which attracted more Mormon crickets to eat it up, creating more slick, i.e. a safety hazard, like ice on the roads, but oh, so much worse. One hospital was swarmed with them and apparently had to create like a cricket patrol to escort patients to and from their cars into the hospital. And they would clear out the walkways and the walls using brooms and leaf blowers, to get the crickets off, which is just crazy to think about because for them, that's just what they do, you know? And they've been doing it for thousands, if not millions of years. And from our perspective, it looks like Armageddon. Ah! I think if we still lived in hunter-gatherer societies, we would be stoked about this, but we don't. So shit shuts down instead and we find it repulsive, but I digress. I'm gonna throw this next one over to my friend Casual Geographic, who knows a chilling amount of the more heinous side of the animal kingdom. At least that's what my search history says. Hey, Casual Geographic here, how's it going? Now you've probably seen what looks like a satanic ritual with turkey circling a past tense cat just outside Boston. I think I can explain, but first we gotta talk turkeys. They're not as stupid as you think. I know there's this whole thing about them being dumb enough to drown in a rainstorm just by looking up. Well, that's actually a myth based on this thing they can get called titanic torticular spasms. Also, they're not stupid. Wild turkeys have been known to forage with other animals like deer and squirrels and even use each other as alarm systems for predators. They've even, even been seen playing with the animals they forage with, especially deer fawn, so you know it's not just transactional. If you're still not convinced, go ahead and ask a hunter how stupid turkeys are. They'll either curse under their breath, give you the thousand yard stare, or just walk out the room entirely in disgust. Put it this way, there's gonna be at least one family that has KFC for Thanksgiving because their hunter father severely underestimated what turkeys are about. Turkeys are also social animals, living in complex groups of up to and over 50 birds with a hierarchy and a pecking order. That's not a pun, it's an order literally enforced through pecking. Their main self-defense is their numbers, so it's likely that one turkey started circling the expired cat to see if it's a threat while being far enough to not find out, and the rest just followed suit, leading to this. And before you judge them, just remember the invisible line prank. Meaning, if you and enough people step over literally nothing, eventually bystanders will believe there's something there, even if their eyes tell them otherwise. Yeah, turkeys don't seem so dumb now, or at least not until you see them circle a tree. I can't tell you for sure what's happening here, but uh... There's some theories. One, it's just a massive game to them. Two, they're playing follow the leader, but with some serious miscommunication. Or three, it's like a turkey Truman show with us watching them and some turkey hidden in the trees filming us. Imagine they're like, hey, you see that species that literally put a man on the moon? I bet we could waste 10 minutes of their life just by walking around a tree. And now you're watching this video, so looks like it worked. And for another weird animal happening, in 2005, over a thousand toads were found in a pond in Hamburg, and they all appeared to have exploded. The toads were tested for bacterial infections or some type of kermicide committing virus, but nothing. They tested the water for chemicals and nothing still, and the fish in the same pond seemed perfectly fine. So what happened? Apparently crows, who had figured out how to remove the toad's liver for their own culinary purposes. The toad's natural defense mechanism is to puff up and make themselves look bigger, instead blowing up like Hoppenheimer. You know, the worst part is the frogs in the immediately flatline. There was some struggling involved. And now you see why enough crows working together is, scientifically speaking, a premeditated murder in the first degree. And that's gonna do it for me. Take it away, Lindsay. Like Mamadou talked about, and the Rat Kings I covered last year on this channel, spirals in nature can sometimes have bad omen undertones, which is definitely true for this next phenomenon. Ants, death spirals also known as ant mills, where ants get lost or disoriented and become trapped, moving in an endless circle until they die from exhaustion, like a glitch in the simulation. That is surprisingly not that rare for ants and can happen in massive numbers. The largest death spiral ever recorded was apparently 1,200 feet across and took each ant two and a half hours to make one revolution. So how does this happen? So ants, 
as we know, live in colonies of up to like 20 million individuals, which only function through insane cooperation and organization. You know, each ant has a role to play. They got their shit figured out. Otherwise it would be complete anarchy. And a lot of this organization is communicated through pheromones, chemical signals. Those little assembly lines of foraging ants that you see running through your kitchen are constructed by pheromones, i.e. set trails. They guide ants to and from food sources and back to the rest of the colony. It's one of the many factors that make them so successful, allows them to act as a hive mind. And also they are practically blind. So they rely on the scent trails to get them where they need to go. While these scent trails have evolutionarily worked really well for them, they now make up 15 to 20% of the terrestrial animal biomass, which is fucking nuts. They also have a major flaw. The pheromone trail can be easily disrupted, easily by predators, strong weather conditions, humans, like some asshole slamming his foot into the ant line feeling like God. And it can be hard for them to find the original scent trail again. They can get disoriented, potentially end up looping back onto their own scent or the ant behind them. Then before you know it, they're caught in a circle, following the ant in front of them, thinking they're going somewhere for loops and loops and loops and loops and loops. Well, this sounds like a funny little hiccup. It's called a death spiral for a reason. They don't realize they're caught in a loop and they just keep going until they're exhausted and die. On the off chance that they do make it out, ants that have survived these ant death spirals have been known to exhibit heightened aggression or can't navigate the environment as well. They get traumatized. This is serious stuff. Another group this occasionally happens to is fungus gnat larvae, which look like this. Simple larva, nothing crazy. But they travel in these groups and kind of function as a single mass kind of like the ants. They do this to move faster and also confuse predators. It is a safe and efficient way to get them where they need to go. But these migrations don't always go as planned. And it seems that sometimes the little individuals at the front get turned around and end up making contact with the ones in the back and accidentally form an endless ring. And like the ants, they go around in circles and circles. <laughs> not realizing no one's leading them anymore. Quite the metaphor, isn't it? Think for yourself, otherwise your mouth might meet someone else's ass. I remember when I used to watch YouTubers when I was like 12, they would end their videos with like a Q&A section or answering questions from their DMs or comments. And I decided that I wanna start doing that. So I went through my Instagram DMs and I found some cute little guys to feature. So first one, could you explain to me why this guy is T-posing in my hallway? Yes. That is, you guessed it, a T-Moth named such because when they are at rest, like so, they roll up their wings super tight to camouflage as some sort of dried up foliage, which ends up looking like a T, hence the t pose. They're found in Europe, North Africa, Asia, North America, and kind of just hang out, nothing crazy other than that. And when they're not rolled up like this, they look like this, stunning. But those wings make for some pretty shit flying capabilities. And next, what is this insect? That is actually one of my favorite types of insects, a weevil. Weevils are cute as fuck. They're giving cottage coal. They look like they have little shops to sell trinkets and potions. I feel like they need wizard hats. I don't know exactly what type of weevil this is. Maybe a thistlebud weevil. A bug identifier app told me acorn weevil, but I don't know. I'm gonna give weevils their own video because there are so many of them and they all look nuts. So be on the lookout for that. But yeah, another one that just hangs out. If you have any questions you would like to see me answer, we're gonna start doing that, so put them in the comments. Maybe it'll get featured in the next video, so be sure to subscribe for that. And also, so you don't miss the next episode of The History of Life on Earth, that we know of. Stay tuned for the merch, dropping soon, and you can keep up with my short form content on TikTok and Instagram. Check out my Patreon for live streams and the Discord server, and a massive thanks to Casual Geographic for joining me on this video. For now, stay curious. The world has a lot for us to learn. See ya! Let me look up how to pronounce that. Hey, <sighs> Shriko Both. I feel like it would be Trico. Trico Bothria. Shriko Bothria. Trico Bothria. Bothria. That sounds nice. Trico Bothria. That's the same bitch. Trico Bothria. That's different. That's what I thought it was. Trico Bothria. Let's just combine them.